I don't want no oil. The spoil in my shoreline, I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No nukes! Hello, Toledo. Good morning. And good morning, good afternoon, Columbus. And hello to those of you listening on the Internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and you have tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology and the environment and how they affect you, your family, your pocketbook, your health, your happiness. And uh, this week, we're very happy to be uh, talking about these things with uh, our new co-host, uh, Rebecca Wood. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, we've got a really nice show lined up for you today. We've got uh, Rebecca, of course, is our new co-host. We'll be talking to her a little bit. And uh, then we have a, a guest calling in at 8.15. His name is Michael Oberdick, and he uh, owns a computer and, te- and telephone repair store down in Bowling Green there. He's going to be talking to us about the right to repair, which is uh, an interesting battle in in order to get people to allow companies to create products that can be fixed. Because right now a lot of companies are making things that can't be fixed, and so they end up just getting thrown away, which, of course, is not the eco way to do things. That's not the way of a green future, which is what we're all about here. Um, Let's see. Then we're going to have... uh, After we talk to Michael, we'll hear from our wonderful sponsors, give you some updates on House Bill 6, and then then we'll go from there. And, of course, what we like to say is this is the best show in Ohio, but it gets better every time you call at 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. You can call in about any sort of ecological or environmental topic, anything you've heard in the news, um, Anything that uh, you've got questions about, we'd be happy to to take them. Isn't that right, Rebecca? Absolutely. Yes. (laughs) And uh, so one thing I I wanted to talk about in this introduction, though, uh, I had an unpleasant experience this past week. I am the political director for the Ohio Green Party, although on this show I do not speak for the Green Party. I I speak only for myself, as you will when you you call in at 866-240-1065. And I have been running. I haven't talked about it on the show at all, but I was a candidate for for council at large in Bowling Green and really looking forward to it and getting into the campaign. And then this past week, the station has informed me that thanks to the equal time law, I can't both have a radio program and be a candidate for political office. And so... I was forced to choose, and so I, I chose all of you. I chose the the um, becoming staying a radio talk show host because I think the information we get out here on For a Green Future is vital. I think it's things that you don't really hear anywhere else, and I think we have to continue to do that. But I find this incredibly ironic because as the, the political director of the Ohio Green Party, I have fought many, many times with television stations with radio stations, with newspapers, to get coverage for Green Party candidates. And I, and I thought that perhaps the equal time rule would, would 
make that happen. But it turns out the equal time rule does not require radio stations or TV stations to cover candidates. It does not mean they have to give them equal time. It just means that, it, but it does restrict things like owning a, a radio program. So it, it's really a law that's not doing what it's designed to do, in my opinion. It's uh, it's kind of, it's pretty sad, really. So. so what is the solution to that? Do you think rewriting the law would help or uh, or did, did going to the courts, what route enforcement, what, where, where is it falling down? Well, the thing is that it's, this is actually, the whole equal, equal time thing isn't, really in law it's it's a rule it's put out by the fcc you know they they interpret the idea that you've got to present all views and they've interpreted it with rules and those rules shut out third parties for the most part while putting limits on things like this on talk show host and so i I think yeah i think it would i think it needs to become a law and it needs to be rewritten to say that all sides do get equal time, at least enough time, to put their positions out there and their candidates and so forth. Um, yeah, because right now what's happening is that radio stations and TV stations are making up these arbitrary rules for coverage. So, for example, uh, if you're a statewide candidate, a lot of TV stations have said, well, you've got to raise at least $100,000. Up until that point, We're not even going to mention you. We're not going to talk about you because you're not important because you haven't raised enough money. And so these kinds of arbitrary rules are being put in place by corporate management. And so I do think there is a need to rewrite the equal equal time law. But um, right now I just have to, to live with the situation as it is. And so my apologies to everyone in Bowling Green who was planning on voting for me. But uh, I've I've actually already turned in the, the withdrawal letter, and uh, it's yeah it's heartbreaking because I was really looking forward to it was an interesting race I would have been running against uh, right now there's no Republican on the ticket so it would have been me versus a Democrat uh, the Democrat's name was Nicholas Leontis and right now he's got a, a clear field he has no opponent it's possible someone might do a write-in but Nicholas is a great guy I've actually had him as a guest on this show. Uh, he's got a lot of fantastic positions on a lot of issues, but in my opinion, he's not hardcore enough. He needs you to to spur him on to his best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's what Greens Greens are pretty good at that. It's, it's kind of amazing how Democratic Dems become when there's a Green around. You know, other <laughs> yeah, when we're not around, it it gets kind of hard to tell the from the other that other party. So um, so I just had to tell you guys about that, do a little bit of complaining, because, you know, after all, this is my show, so I I get to complain about things like that on the air. So, um, but now it's not just my show, now it's our show. I have a co-host, Rebecca Wood. Um, Rebecca, hi. Do you want to tell the people a little bit about yourself? We don't need to go into a bio or anything like that, but just um, anything you want to say about Rebecca that you think the audience should know? I spent really my most of my my whole adult life in the the Great Lakes area, mostly northern Ohio. Uh, born in Michigan, so I have a lot of relatives up there. I'm currently on disability. I'm a poet. <laughs> ah, well, good. Well, and we will be looking forward to some poetry, perhaps in future episodes. I can do that, maybe. All right, cool. And I, I also know that that you're um, basically. One reason I asked you to be a co-host is because I know you're you're kind of a dependable person, a go-to person. If, if something needs to be done and someone asks you to for help, you you're right there and you you just help them. And that's uh, I've always admired that, and I think that's a great quality in a co-host. So well, we have to help each other. It's yeah. hard times. <laughs> yeah. So all right. Well, um, so we've got about four minutes till our our guest Michael Oberdick calls in, and of course. You can call in at any time at 866-240-1065. And the big news right now, eco-wise, is, of course, the uh, disaster going on down there in New Orleans. Um, And uh, we've talked about this on the show before, that how global warming affects things like this. You know, the the opponents to global warming, the, the, the people that 
say, oh, it's all a hoax and it's just some guy trying to sell refrigerators made this whole thing up. Um, they say, oh, there have always been hurricanes. There's always been rain episodes. But things are different. These rains, these hurricanes, they're getting stronger. They're acting in bizarre ways that hurricanes have never acted before. And um, there was a, I actually saw a picture that I put up on my Facebook page this past week. It was Washington, D.C., and they had an intense rain event. And what happened was that they got literally a season's worth of rain. They got something like 10 inches in the space of an hour. And so this picture that I put up on my Facebook post shows a guy standing. He's in a, he's in a business attire. He's got a pink dress shirt. He's standing on top of his car, which is flooded right up to the roof. And he's on a cell phone <laughs> and, like, gesturing to whoever he's calling And to me, that just sort of summed up the government's response, our society's response to to global warming right now. Because he, yeah, I mean, he, in other words, he just ignored it until his car was flooded. (laughs) Then he was on his cell phone like, what the heck's going on? What's what's happening? Uh, If only someone had been telling us for the last 20, 30 years this was going to happen. (laughs) (laughs) Right, yeah. It's like, and so... What's going on in New Orleans is is in the same category because basically what's happening is that an atmosphere that has more carbon dioxide can hold more water vapor. And so what's happening with that is that – so this both causes faster evaporation. Um, We had tons of rain in Bowling Green last week, and then I went out to my garden, and the soil was already dry just a couple days later. So water evaporates more quickly, and then there's more of it in the atmosphere. And so then when finally there is a precipitation event, it just pours. It's just a deluge. And that's what we saw happening in Washington, D.C. this past week, and that's what we're seeing happening now down in New Orleans. And, uh, you know, it's like get ready, folks. Get get used to it. But some people say, oh, well, now we just have to adapt. Well, the first thing you have to do is stop putting carbon in the air. <clears throat> then we can talk about adapting because uh, if you if you just start trying adapting, if you just start building huge levees and, and flood control projects and water, water containment basements and think catchments and things like that, without solving the basic problem, it's kind of like being an alcoholic and taking vitamins. You know, yeah, you you'll live. Longer, maybe you might be healthier, perhaps, but um, you're not solving the basic problem. It's going to get worse. And you know, honestly, if the if the government doesn't care enough to stop this, to, to to take steps to stop global warming, how does it care enough about human beings to keep those those projects to keep people safe going? You know, I don't see it happening. I um, I think they're going to protect the middle class and wealthy people, possibly. I mean, we can't even fill potholes. Really, we're going to have this great water system that's going to keep us safe. I'm not sure that's going to happen. No, well, and uh, another thing about Louisiana down there is after Hurricane Katrina, they designed a $10 billion flood improvement project with brand-new levees, um, and they, they literally, since Katrina, the Army Corps of Engineers has been nonstop working down there, building up a whole new flood control system. And guess what? A, it's already sinking (laughs) because because they underestimated the rate of sea level rise. And so the sea was already like almost over top the new dikes and the new flood control projects. And with this storm, those are the levees that that you see failing because this storm is just putting a little more water in than they engineered for. And uh, so there, there's neighborhoods going under. And they spent $10 billion in, in, what is it now, 12 years? And it failed. So so this whole idea that we're going to somehow adapt to global warming. Uh-uh. So, it's an arms race. You know, it's just going to keep going. Right. And more and more money poured down the rat hole. 
Sure. And in this arms race, I think nature's going to win. <laughs> yeah. I think in an arms race with the atmosphere, the atmosphere is going to win. So, uh, all right. So we are at 816 and eagerly awaiting a call from our, our hoped for guest, Michael Oberdick. And uh, the right to repair is a, it's an interesting right because this is, this is something that you, it kind of goes to the question of ownership. It's like you go out, you buy a phone. You think that's your phone. And yet, if it needs a repair, if something needs to be done to it, companies have engineered their phones so that only they can repair them. And so is it really your phone, or are they just sort of lending you their phone? Because because if something goes wrong, you can't take it somewhere and get it fixed. You have to pay them to repair it. So it's kind of like you're making extra payments on, kind of like you're only leasing your own telephone. So, so. Michael will be calling in with that, but uh, I do have some other things I, want, I can talk about until until Michael gets here. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, on this show we have in the past talked about uh, cars. We've talked about the new sort of the electric cars, the plug-in cars, the hybrid cars. Uh, we had a whole show on that back. I think that was episode two or three actually. And so if you want to go to the podcast uh, at for a green future or the YouTube video at For a Green Future, you can listen to that show. It was, it was amazing. It was a terrific show. Um, but what I've had happen personally in, in my personal life is that uh, my wife's father has lost his license because he was 95, and it's just, you know, it happens. At some point, Time for that. <laughs> everybody has to give up your, your driver's license. So now we're driving him everywhere. And uh, he actually uh, offered to buy a car for us because now we have to carry him and his walker and our little compact, which gets great mileage. Uh, we don't all fit in there. So uh, so he offered to buy a car. And so we, we buy her a car specifically. So we went looking for cars. We went looking, and of course, being an eco person, we wanted a hybrid. We wanted and specifically, we wanted a plug-in hybrid because that both gives you the hybrid mileage and it, it gives you the uh, flexibility then to take long trips. And so we kind of we settle on the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid, which is a van. And uh, people are a lot of people are familiar with the Pacifica because that's one of the G- Chrysler's most popular cars. But in trying to buy this hybrid we ran into all kinds of problems, specifically the dealers. A, we could not find a dealer that had one in the Toledo region. And we, we looked, we searched, we finally found one. So we found one. And they only had one hybrid. They had a 2018, which uh, they said they've had on their lot for a year and a half. And the salespeople were continuously like discouraging us, they were saying nobody buys hybrids, you know. And we were asking, we were asking people, well, why don't you have the hybrid? It's oh, people don't want them, and it's like we want them. <laughs> but when you people want them, you don't have them. <laughs> right. And they kept steering us over to the regular Pacifica. You know, they were like, oh, but the you know the regular Pacifica, that's a great car. Everybody loves that car. And we, and uh, so, but we we insisted. You know, finally we got one. Uh, we found one dealer that had one. We went to take a test drive. It was not charged up, which means that oh. it was driving just like a regular Pacifica hybrid or a Pacifica car because um, without the battery boost, it's just a normal car. So, uh, And I've since gone on the Internet and I've talked to people and discovered that this is actually a very common experience around the country that people – Literally, like, they'll find one dealer in their entire state that has one on the lot, and they have to search, and they have to to insist, and they have to – in other words, they make it as hard as possible to actually buy the kind of car that we need to switch over to. And so then car companies then say, oh, nobody buys the hybrids. Well, if you make it really difficult to get them, then they're not going to buy them. 
So it's sort of similar logic to when you tell business owners you, you need to have a, your, your store needs to be accessible to people in wheelchairs, and they say, oh, but we never get any people in wheelchairs in here. Right, right, exactly. It's just coincidental that, you know, there's that giant step there they can't get across. I'm sure that's not why. <laughs> right, yeah. And it's – so – so it it's it seems to be a pattern, and uh, you know, the same thing actually happened. We went and looked at a another car earlier, a smaller car that we were going to be able to afford possibly, and uh, same thing with a different dealer, different brand. Again, they were like, "Oh, you don't want the hybrid version; <laughs> you want the, the the regular version. That's a great car." And it's like we've got one hybrid, and it. So has anyone else had this experience? Eight six six two four zero. 1065 um, If any of you have been out and tried to get a hybrid or thought about getting a hybrid and just sort of got steered away from it, or uh, you can give us a call and uh, we'll we'll talk about it. So um, Michael has not yet called in, and uh, we are hoping he. Eight o'clock Sunday morning is tough for some people, and I, I really appreciate you guys listening and getting up and turning the radio on and also taking an hour out of sports because this is, um, you know, this is normally a sports station and promptly at nine o'clock, Mick Gonzalez is going to be back with his terrific show. Uh, it's called the cheap seats. And, uh, but for an hour here, I think it's good to just talk about something a little more broad or something that, uh, affects all of us. And so I appreciate your listening. All right, so now what else do we have here on, on TAP? A uh, very interesting study came out this week, or actually it came out in April, but it was uh, pub- picked up by a great organization called Beyond Nuclear this past week and starting to get um, publicized. And that is, uh, remember the Chernobyl nuclear accident? Do you, do you recall that, Rebecca? I certainly do, yeah. Yeah. Well, the effects from Chernobyl, of course, are continuing, and they're going to be continuing for the next quarter million years or so. But one of the things they did in response to Chernobyl was they created this uh, no man's land, this this area around the plant where they said no one can live and no new building and essentially let it go back to nature. And if you go into that area, there's lots of animals, lots of birds, lots of creatures and nuclear power proponents are, have seized on that and said, look at this, radiation isn't dangerous. I mean, we've got all these animals living in this highly radioactive area, and they're doing great. There's there's bears and there's bison. and, and Well, unfortunately, the truth is that what's happening is animals are coming into the radioactive area because there are no humans, and they're colonizing, but their subsequent generations, more and more mutations and more and more genetic errors come up, and so that population dies out. Really? And so what's happening is the whole area is being s- repeatedly recolonized by animals. It's like nature keeps sending in some scouts to say, is, is this livable? And they keep dying off and yeah. saying, and, and so there was a study this past week that, that again showed this. It was a study of voles which uh, you might not think about voles very often. You might not think about them. They're, they're cute little critters, and, uh, but they're always underfoot. They're just sort of, that, that's the corner of the eye animal that just sort of scurries out of sight as you come around. But voles are in the Chernobyl zone, and they've been studying them since Chernobyl. And what they found is that it's a straight line correlation that, even the smallest amounts of additional radiation mean that the, the voles suffer reproductive failure after a couple of generations. And it, it's, it's a direct, you know, there's no safe threshold. Even a minuscule amount of additional radiation long-term causes problems. And the severity of the problem exactly matches the amount of radiation in that area because uh, radiation from a nuclear fallout is not evenly distributed. It, it doesn't actually fit in these little circles that we draw around nuclear plants for evacuation zones and things. Because wind probably, for starters. Yes, exactly. Wind wind is kind of random, and it, it spreads stuff out. And so 
they, they're able to compare this pocket, you know, this little gully or this little area, and it's got so many uh, counts per minute higher than this little area over here. And so they can directly compare populations of voles in both. And it's, it's once again, straight line. Any additional causes additional problems. The less there is, the fewer the problems. And, but eventually it catches up. And so that's, that's a, uh, just something to keep in mind when we're thinking about things like uh, House Bill 6, which is we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and House Bill 6, of course, for those who haven't tuned in before, is the bill which would bail out Ohio's nuclear plants. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that a little bit more after the, the bottom of the hour. But it looks like we did not get Michael this week. I'm afraid I don't know what happened at his end, but we'll we'll get him on a future show. Definitely. He had a tiring week. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. A lot of, a lot of rain, a lot of humidity. Yes. Uh, and a lot of humidity actually leads to a lot of phones dying because uh, iPhones, all you have Sounds. to do is, is, like, have them in your pocket if you're real sweaty, and just the, the condensation on the inside can ruin them. I actually used to repair iPhones for a while and, and computers. Uh, that was my job for a bit, and I, I would see people come in and, crying because you know they're like i never got it wet but all you have to do is get it like humid and damp have it with you in the shop in the bathroom as you shower i've made that mistake yeah. oh have you yeah mm-hmm. so so it's it's a terrible thing so so don't bring the your iphone into the shower with you that's or into even into the same room that you're showering in nope a little bit of helpful advice that could save you hundreds of dollars so <laughs> All right. Well, 866-240-1065, we are at the bottom of the hour, and we, as always, will take your call on any kind of environmental issue. But since we are at what we say in Radio Land is the bottom of the hour, uh, we're going to go ahead and hear from our wonderful sponsors. So our first sponsor is the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature, restore wildlife habitats, and lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves around Wood County, which are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And they have a few interesting things coming up. They have coming up on August 23rd, they have their Hiking for Health series. Hiking for Health will be happening at Otsego Park, which is at 20,000 West River Road in Bowling Green. And there you can join a naturalist for exercise and the wonder of watching the seasonal changes. The hikes will offer true mind-body connection. Sign up for one week or all three. Leader Jim Witter. Yeah, did you hear how I actually connected mind and body and made the word mahdi? There. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah. To think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to register for the uh, hiking for health series, you would c- go to their website www.wcparks.org, or call the Wood County Park District headquarters at 419-353-1897. Then on Aug- before that, August 10th, they have something along the same lines. It's called Self Care Saturday. And that is an event that goes from 12 to 1.30 p.m. at the W.W. Night Nature Preserve. That's at 29530 White Road in Perrysburg. And they're going to be practicing forest therapy. And that's where you practice the connection between yourself and the earth. And by practicing this connection, you reduce stress, depression, and anxiety. You reduce your blood pressure and your heart rate. It also can help with symptoms of OCD and ADHD and it can increase your sense of well-being. It could boost your immunity, your mental clarity, your creativity, and your concentration. The cost for this program is $15, and again, you would talk to Jim Witter, and again, you would go to wcparks.org. And the Wood County Park District also has many volunteer opportunities. They're always going out and clearing out invasive species. Uh, they have a greenhouse where they grow native plants, and if you want to become a volunteer for the Wood County Park District, you can call. You can go to the website wcparks.galaxydigital.com. That's wcparks.galaxydigital.com. And for those of you listening outside the area, Wood County Parks 
Wood County is just south of Lucas County, uh, right there on I-75. So it's a great park system, and head on out to the Wood County Park District. Our other sponsor for this hour is DeMar Consulting. Uh, DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting corp company. The difference is that they will come to your home. So if you're having trouble, maybe your computer's not talking to your printer. Maybe you have a computer that needs backing up or a computer that uh, has been backed up but you need actually restored. DeMar Consulting will come out and they will help you in a very uh, professional manner they have everyone who works at DeMar Consulting has a degree in computer science, so uh, you know that they know what they're talking about. And so they can help you install software. They can teach you how to use things. Maybe you're someone who's just finally gotten around to getting something like email. Uh, they can come out and help. So that's uh, two ways to get a hold of DeMar Consulting. One is to go to their website, which is simply demarconsulting.com, and DeMar is spelled D E M. A-R-E, then the word consulting.com, or you can call them at 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. So those are our fantastic sponsors, and we're very happy to hear from them. Uh, and let's see. And again, you, we're all, we'd also be very happy to hear from you if you call in at 866 240 1065 with any sort of environmental or, or eco question that you might have. So let's see now, where are we? So we did not have Michael Oberdick call in. And those of you who are regular listeners know that we have, usually at this time, we do our letter from the future. My uh, great great granddaughter, Marie I, uh, normally sends me a letter that appears right next to my bed. There's this flash of photons every Sunday morning. and Poof, there's a letter. Uh, but it didn't happen this week. And, and I'm really, I'm a little worried because normally she's extremely dependable. So. I hope she's okay. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> Not much I could do about it here in, 20, in you know, this year. But, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope she's all right. This, last week she wrote a very short letter because they were on a, uh, a vacation in the Arctic. They were on a solar-powered dirigible, and they were doing whale watching. So that sounded great. I don't know. So no letter for the future this week. All right. So now um, let's see. Again, 866-240-1065, and we are here at the 830 mark. And um, I was really hoping Michael Oprah would, would call in. So I think we're going to have to basically just sort of to wing it here for a little bit, Rebecca. Are, are you up to it? Sure, why not? You know, I, Kate, I remember hearing a thing on the radio relating to the forest therapy thing. Oh, yeah. There was, okay. The reason that, um, the reason that human beings are supposed to enjoy bird song is actually that where there's birds around, where, where there's birds around uh, and you can hear them singing, this means that there's a lot of things that humans need to survive. Like there's, Probably water. There's it's a place that game like a lot because there's cover and food and high nutrients and things. So hmm. there's sort of a biological basis, I guess, to us enjoying birdsong and and uh, having a sense of well-being about that. Huh. And that, what was the other thing? That, well, that 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 is a very interesting theory because um, I had an experience just this past week that kind of supported that. My my wife and I went and uh, we were trying to figure out what to do for dinner, we decided to do a picnic lunch. So we, nice. so we are actually a picnic dinner. So we went out and we bought, um, we bought some galaba. I don't know if you've ever heard of galaba. I have not. <laughs> it's great. It's a, it's a Lebanese dish and it's uh, fried tomatoes, green peppers, onions, and mushroom over rice. Oh, and chicken or beef over rice uh, with a lemon sauce. And okay. it's, it's terrific. They they sell it down in Bowling Green, and uh, I'm not getting paid for this, but I'll say that it <laughs> they sell it at the great deli down there called Southside Six. And so we bought a thing of galaba, and we went up to the uh, Maumee River at Fort Meigs, and we just laid out a blanket, and we were yeah we were sitting there, and uh, we could hear bird song. You know there were tons of birds, and and we were watching the river and. 
these huge fish were jumping out of the river. It must be mayfly season or something close to it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, like you were saying, it, right there we had water, we had shelter, we had food, we had, and, and birds, lots of bird song. So that's, uh, so yeah, that, that, and we were happy. So that kind of fits in with what you heard on the radio. That's probably why the forest therapy works, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be. It makes you relax and say, aha, okay, I'm in a, a place that will support me. Right. So. Or apparently if you if you show people all over the world like pictures of different environments where they'd like to live, that they all want to live in the, the picture of the uh, like a broad river valley with a river winding through it and um, kind of medium-sized trees because this is a good place for us to live during the very early stages of our hunter and gathering development because – if something comes after you that wants to eat you, you can run up the little short tree. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Have any of our listeners ever had to run away from something that wanted to eat them? If, if so, give us a call at 866-240-1065. We'd love to hear that story. We need to hear that story. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that actually ties in with something I had uh, just last night. We, My wife and I went and watched uh, the Fleet or Rep version of West Side Story. And... The reason I bring that up is because that environment is the exact opposite. You know, that is set in the concrete jungle. There's a place where there's no trees, where, where there's uh, almost zero bird song, and everything is, is hot and, and bare, and you're out in the open on those on parking lots and, and concrete playgrounds. And, and that kind of lends towards that whole dysfunctional society, unhappy people. And uh, so it was. It was a great show. Um, I'd recommend going to see it. It was. It was kind of hot in the theater because it's a small theater, but it was. It was pleasant, or it was a good, good show. A lot of great singing, and it was kind of amazing to me. It's sort of a small stage, but they staged these gang fights where there were 20 plus kids, actors and actresses, um, at high school age. This is a, a young person's production, and they were dive rolling they were jumping over each other it, it, no colli- no collisions that i don't think were supposed to happen so uh yeah so that was a lot of fun but again shows what happens when you take people out of that preferred environment that natural environment and uh, we here for a green future we're all about the green future because we you know everyone should have access to nature everyone should be able to get out into the woods and and uh you know get happy Get out in the woods and get happy. So, all right. Um, I'm kind of. It's kind of interesting that I actually ran through everything I wanted to talk about so quickly. This has actually never happened to me before, even though I'm usually uh, here alone. So we, we could really use a call at 866-240-1065. Now I think we can talk about a couple things that we have on on tap here. One is. I wanted to give people an update on House Bill 6. And uh, House Bill 6 is a, a horrible bill. And actually, Rebecca, you and I went to Columbus and protested House Bill 6. We did, yeah. I remember because a man came up and said he was not from around here and what was happening. And I told him, well, the legislature is uh, trying to pass a bill that is going to decimate the solar and wind power for the next, what is it, 10 years longer and he said, shook his head and said, only in Ohio. But I'm a little worried it's not only in Ohio. I think we're the canary in the coal mine, and this is going to roll over the whole country if we don't stop it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, the, the basic idea of bailing out your nuclear power plants by adding charges to everyone's electric bill, that has already been put in place in New York. So, I mean, the where, high- where Donald Trump, by the way, comes from, so they shouldn't get on, the, up on their high horse. But never mind. That's <laughs> just me being petty. Right, but... <laughs> But I, I think I, one of the things that irks me about this is that Ohio is trying to copy New York, and Ohio is not New York. I mean, we're it's unique, it's distinct, and it, it should be. We shouldn't just be following what they're doing over there. But what they're doing, the basic thing that House Bill 6 does is it adds a charge to everyone's electric bill in order to bail out Davis, Bessie, and Perry nuclear plants. That's, that's the heart of the bill. But then they... they tossed on all kinds of additional things when the when it went through the house they uh they tossed on a requirement that if you have a wind farm development you have to go and have a referendum 
in whatever townships you're they're planning to put wind turbines in. So you literally have to get approval from everybody in the county before you can put up a windmill. Mm. And uh, they also tossed in two coal plants, one in Indiana, that this bailout money is going to go to. Pity then. <laughs> yeah. It's called the Clean Air Act, or, you know, the, or creates a clean air program, but it's funding literally the dirtiest coal plant in the United States, which is one in Indiana, just over the Ohio border. And the, the emissions from that plant pollute both Dayton and Cincinnati. Oh, it, it, dear. It's literally, literally killing asthmatic children right now, and, and they're going to add money to our electric bills, or they want to add money to our electric bills to keep that plant going. And it's the, the, what's fundamentally happening here is that wind and solar have gotten so inexpensive, especially now that utility-scale battery storage is online and it's functional, that these dirty energy sources like nuclear, like coal, literally can't compete. So the whole let the market decide philosophy is, you know, right now the market has decided wind and solar with battery storage is the cheapest form of power. And we've got lots of businesses poised to build turbines, to put up solar panels, to build battery stations. And so what's happening is that they are fleeing to the legislature. They're fleeing to the state government to say, you know, save us from the market forces. You know, don't don't make us don't make us have to compete. We're special, yeah. you know. And and they're so they're adding. They want to add a charge. So what happened is that before the July Fourth break, uh, the, this is passed the House. Okay, so the Senate is working on their version of the bill, and the Senate has about 20 amendments that have been proposed to it. And the Senate bill is marginally better in a couple ways. It got rid of the uh, referendum, and it also uh, uh, one of the things the first bill does is it eliminates uh, Ohio's energy efficiency and alternative energy portfolio programs, just just destroys them, and the House bill instead just reduces them drastically. Doesn't destroy well, it destroys the still gets rid of the energy efficiency, but it it just reduces uh, the renewable energy portfolio standards. Uh, and, of course, remember, House version, Senate version, if the Senate passes their version, even though it's better, then they still have to do the reconciliation to get the final bill. And so all those horrible things in the House version can just go right back in during that reconciliation process. So even though the House bill is marginally better, it's still bad and, and unacceptable. But they are meeting they're going to have another hearing on Monday. Mm. They they recessed, they went off without passing the bill, which was a good thing because First Energy had given them a deadline, which, you know, imagine that. The CEO wrote the state legislature a memo saying, have this decided by June 30th or we're going to close the plants. And they didn't decide by June 30th, and they didn't close the plants, so they were bluffing. But... Um, but now they're they're taking it back up again on Monday at the Senate Energy Subcommittee. So uh, I spoke on this bill. I've gone to Columbus four times to speak on this bill. And I have to say that the the senators there at that hearing all seemed to be very much in doing First Energy's bidding. They were, they were just like, well, you know, oh, First Energy wants this. We will give First Energy that. But three-quarters of Ohioans don't want this bill. And they don't want it precisely because it bails out the nuclear power plants. And so it's um, kind of crazy. It's, it's like the best example I've ever seen of corporations trying to take over elected governments because the, the fundamental thing that happened with this is that First Energy picked uh, 12 legislators in the Republican primaries and gave them enough money to win the primary in order to put this bill through once they got elected. That's that's the basic story here. It's literally a corporation trying to take over our government. And so there's going to be more hearings on Monday. I think they're going to be dealing with these amendments that they're talking about. But even with all these amendments, that the, even if every single amendment to improve the bill passes, 
the fundamental bill, the fundamental idea that we are going to bail out Davis Bessey and Perry nuclear plants is unacceptable. So this, this should not pass the Senate. Uh, but so call your senators if you don't want money added to your bill. Uh, so did you want to maybe go over the major cast of characters? Who's really pushing for this thing? Who's trying to hold it back a little anyway? Who's teetering? Do we know? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We don't really have a good picture of that mm. uh, because the, the the people who are pushing it are very straightforward. It's it's uh, the chairman of the House, householder. It's a uh, senator, right? Or, or excuse me, how, the House of Representative. Uh, the representative rights, it's representative uh, Stein, you know, it's our, it's representative Vitali. You know, the ones that got the most money from from First Energy are, are shouting the loudest, basically. Funny coincidence. Yeah, it, it's just odd that it yeah. just kind of lines up. So they're they're out very forcefully out front. Um, the opposition is not so clear that some some Democrats are opposing it. Uh, but unfortunately, a third of the House Democrats voted for it, and a third of the House Republicans voted against it. So this is not a clear case. It's it's, it's the better predicting prediction. Don't look at the parties. Look at the contributions. That's that's a better way to see who's who's pushing this and who's who's uh, trying to hold it up or slow it down or ameliorate it. Wow. But so party affiliation almost kind of irrelevant then. For this bill. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's uh it's kind of crazy. But but one thing I've taken great pride in is that we've held it up. I mean, they literally they wanted this by June 30th and uh with our protests with people calling in um it has not progressed the way First Energy wanted it to. They thought we they could skate over Ohio the same way they skated over New York. Right. And it has not been a skate. It's been, I don't know, they, they've been limping along. They've tossed out more and more cash, though. The last uh, number I've heard is that they've spent $7 million on advertising trying to convince the people of Ohio to, to buy this, to buy into this. And so far, that $7 million has been a miserable failure. I mean, Ohioans can see BS. Ohioans can sort of cut through that kind of thing and, you know, it's not enough to just toss a commercial out there and just expect, oh, we're, they're persuaded. No, something a little stubborn about Ohioans. Or, you know, they, they kind of look at things and they could sense that, that, that this is not quite right here. So so that's been giving me some hope that that, that $7 million so far has been wasted. Um, if they pass this, this is going to be something that it will be a failure of democracy if they pass it because – Three quarters of Ohioans don't want it. This the, our democratic process got usurped by First Energy, mm-hmm. and so um, fingers are crossed. And so, and we got to we got to keep watching. That's that's the main thing is we got to keep the attention on this because as long as we keep the focus on it, it's been pushed off. It's been it's been delayed. I would, I would think that first of all, when you say there's going to be more money on your electric bill for poorly defined reasons, that's going to upset a lot of people. Yes, that is true. Now, the Republicans are arguing that uh, because it eliminates or slashes the renewable standards and the energy efficiency standards, which right now are funded by charges on the bill, that this is going to be a reduction in people's bills. But what the energy efficiency program does is it reduces people's electric bills. And so, right. and it's by law, it has to reduce the bills more than the charge that people have been have been put on people, and so that actually saves people money, and so by eliminating that, now you now people's electric bills will go up because more energy will be wasted. So it's it's a terrible terrible thing, and we're going to continue to fight it, and we're going to continue to give you guys updates. And another issue that we're going to update you on is uh, Bowling Green's plastic bag ban. And so uh, there is going to be a first reading of the ban tomorrow at Bowling Green City Council, which meets at 7 o'clock at City Hall. And we're the first city in the area, in the region, to, to ban plastic bags, hopefully, knock on wood. Now, 
there's a, a couple Republicans on the, the Bowling Green City Council, and what they've decided to do is toss out this idea that after we go through the whole process, and this process started back in December is when uh, people started talking about the ban, and dozens of people uh, testified on it, and it was about three to one in favor of the ban. And they've had, uh, they had like four hearings. They've had it. They've talked about it before city council meeting. They've talked about it at city council meetings. And so after going through that whole process and getting the bill written and getting it out of committee and having all this public input, uh, the Republicans say once we do that and then the council passes it, then we should have a referendum on top of that. And it's like if, if we had wanted a referendum, we could have just bypassed the whole council and put a referendum on the ballot from the beginning. Yeah. And the whole idea of an elected assembly, the whole idea of electing a council to make laws is that you go through the council. Um, I mean, I love direct democracy. If we had direct democracy, right now we would be fighting climate change because 75% of Americans believe in it and think we should be doing something about it. And uh, like in Switzerland, they have direct democracy. They vote, the whole population votes on every law, which is great. I love it. But what's happened here is the Republicans have said on this specific issue, we need to have a referendum because, uh, well, frankly, because they're, they're going to lose because the, the council is in favor of the plastic bag ban. So they want to just toss another uh, grenade in there, toss another obstacle in. And, uh, you know, I would love a referendum on House Bill 6. That'd be beautiful, yeah. Wouldn't it? And, in fact, uh, there is discussion that perhaps if the council, if the state government passes House Bill 6, we should do a referendum that not only overturns House Bill 6, but defines Ohio's energy future and specifically says we want to move away from nukes, away from coal, away from natural gas, and towards renewable sources like wind and solar and geothermal. And uh, so that's, so wouldn't that be great? So That would be just a ticket, yeah. Yeah, so that... That might happen if they pass this bill. We may we may go do that. Now, the natural gas companies are also threatening a, a referendum if House Bill 6 passes because right now the nukes are in competition with the natural gas plants because Ohio has, Ohio has effectively outlawed wind turbines with the uh, setback law they passed in 2014. They outlawed wind farms. And so what has happened in Ohio in the inter- years since 2014 is a lot of companies and a lot of municipalities have built natural gas generating plants and they don't want house bill six because it's going to prop up the nuke plants which takes business away from them so they've threatened to do a referendum if house bill six passes but any referendum they do would favor the natural gas industry it would you know probably overturn the bailout but it would not help us shift to wind and solar and geothermal heating. It would keep us with the, the, lots of natural gas generation. And, you know, that's fracking. And don't get me started on fracking because yeah. fracking is bad, <laughs> very bad. So um, so that's where we're at on those those two issues. And one thing I, I want to I like to point out about the plastic bag ban in Bowling Green is that this is – that's just the first step, you know, banning plastic bags. One of the things the critics say is that it's it's hardly going to do anything, you know. Well, that's not true. There's thousands of tons of plastic bags that that would be stopped by a ban. But it is just a tiny fraction of the plastics problem. And we do have to eventually get completely off of petroleum-based plastics. That is... Um, shown every day. We all see pictures on the internet and on the news of whales that are getting strangled by by plastic of animals like sea turtles that die and their stomachs are full of plastic. And that's just the tip of the, the plastic iceberg because the real problem with plastics is when it when they break up in the ocean and become little microscopic beads of plastic that can then get ingested by fish and it gets right into their tissues, and then we eat the fish, and it gets right into our tissues. Lovely. Yeah, it's it's not it's so. Yes, this is just a tiny bit 
but it's the first tiny bit. You know, it's the whole question of is the glass half empty or half full? And the, the answer, of course, as um, is that the question is, are you filling the glass or are you emptying it? So, you know, so this may be just a, a tiny drop, but if it's the first drop of, of many things, then what the European Union did was they first banned plastic bags and they found they survived. Their society didn't collapse. And so a year later, they went back, and now they've banned all single-use plastics, plastic forks, plastic cups that are designed to be just thrown away. And again, their society isn't collapsing. So um, we could do this. We're tough enough. We we survived before plastic. We did. And, and we will survive after plastic. And if you want to solve a problem, you have to start solving the problem. Right. So, yes. So step one, plastic bags. They're, they're easier and there's something we can survive without. We can adapt very easily uh, by buying other sorts of bags, by making our own reusable bags. One thing, the Wood County Green Party is going to have a booth at the Wood County Fair, and we're going to be showing people how to make their own shopping bags out of um, T-shirts. It's used T-shirts, you know, and it's very easy. All right. Well, we've got to wrap it up. I just got a wrap it up signal, so... This is Joe Damar. I just want to thank you all for listening, and we'll be back next week. And thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah, it's been great. This is Joe Damar signing off.